Hey, good morning and welcome to Calvary Online. We're so glad you joined us today. We're going to start by giving God our praise together. We believe that there's nothing that our God cannot do, that his promises are working in our lives. Just join us today. Lift up your hands, lift up your hearts, lift up your voice. Let's give him praise together. Just one word, you come the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can do, it's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that a God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Oh, just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can do. It's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. There's nothing that a God can do. It's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. I will believe, oh Lord, I will believe For greater things, there's no power Like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Why we believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like His power, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall he can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do.
so glad that we serve a God that is bigger than the things that we face. You know, a God that there is nothing that he can't do. And I just want to read really quickly from Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I love that promise from God that he is with us, that we don't need to be afraid no matter what we're facing, that we don't need to fear. You know, this next song that we're gonna sing, it speaks about that promise that we don't need to be afraid because of, of what might be ahead of us, because of the unknown. Because God goes before us, and he's behind us, and he's beside us, and he is always with us. So as we sing this next song, I just wanna encourage you to declare those promises as we sing about his faithfulness, as we sing about the things that he can do that we don't need to be afraid. I have this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God still inside the storm, the promise of the shore. And I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first.
will make a way for us. God, that you are faithful.
pray for your presence to be with us. So wherever we are, God, in our homes today, we would be able to sense your presence with us. When we go to work this week, as we work, we pray that your presence would be with us, God. And I pray that through your Holy Spirit that you would just work in our hearts, God. That you would give us faith instead of fear, God, and that through faith, you would show us how we can care for others, God. That you would show us how we can be a light to our neighbors. You can show us where we can be a light to our community. Holy Spirit, we just offer our hearts to you today that you would mold us and that you would make us more like Jesus. In Jesus' name this we pray. Amen. Welcome to Calvary Online. We are so glad you could join us today. If you are new to Calvary, we'd love to connect with you. All you have to do to get started is to text NEW TO HERE to 55498. If you have been with us for some time, don't forget to check in on the Church Center app just to let us know that you are watching our live stream today. To stay connected with what's happening at Calvary, make sure to check out our weekly update at calvaryirwin.com update. And before we hear from God's Word today, we just want to say thank you so much for your generosity, which is impacting our community and impacting our world. To support the mission of Calvary Church is we are leading people to an overflowing life with Jesus. You can give right now or at any time at give.calvaryirwin.com or on the Church Center app. Your giving continues to help us serve those in need and to make a difference. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be interrupting our series with a message that I want to share with you that's uh, really important. Uh, on October 31st, 1517, the German priest Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of his church in Wittenberg, since the church door in those days doubled as a community bulletin board. Luther is rightly remembered as a champion of church reform who translated the Bible into German, wrote famous hymns of the church, and brought some significant changes to the church of his day. Luther, though, could also be very aggressive and opinionated. But what is less known about Martin Luther is that doubt and a fear of death played a major part in Luther's mindset throughout his life. He had extended periods of time where he suffered from dark depression. Particularly later in life, with all his triumphs behind him, he experienced seasons of terror that God had utterly forgotten him and abandoned him to hell. His prayers and cries were often met with simply silence. He, he often felt very alone in the world. At one point, the crushing doubt about his calling led him to such a deep pit of despair that he wrote these words. 
For more than a week, I was close to the gates of death and hell. I trembled in all my members. Christ was wholly lost. I was shaken by desperation and blasphemy of God. He had nightmares and would lie awake, sweating profusely. It was a peculiar but very human mixture of emotion that Martin Luther would experience. On the one hand, he would pen books and hymns in praise of God's glorious gift of freedom through Jesus. But on the other hand, suffering with haunting doubt, guilt, condemnation, and fear. So Luther, the great champion of doctrinal reform, becomes Luther, the troubled human being. One of us, someone we can relate to when he hit the rough terrain of life or hang on the cliffs of despair. And and this is what made Martin Luther such a remarkable man of God. While he faced overwhelming opposition to the point that his life was threatened, and on top of that, suffered with the internal emotional battle of depression, he somehow didn't waver. You see, Luther wasn't a storybook saint, meek and mild with a constant smile and a life free from guilt. He was very human, constantly making mistakes and frequently failing to live up to his own Christian ideals. But he was also honest enough to recognize his shortcomings and never allowed defeat or depression to control his life. Now, I know there are certainly a wide range of experiences and baggage that we all carry on a regular basis. For the brief few moments we have today, though, I want to speak directly into a more specific topic that I don't think we talk about enough in society, and especially within the church. It's addressing the personal prison so many live within because of their own emotional world. There are moments in all of our lives, similar to what Luther would experience, or circumstances stir up emotion within us that can, for some, become paralyzing. For others, create a heavy cloud that hovers over everything they do. And this inner emotional struggle, too often, is one that is a lonely, isolated battle. Today, though, I want to open the prison doors of your inner world that have been chained tight for far too long and let you know that you're among family here. We aren't here to judge, condemn, or make you feel less of who God made you uh, because of the battles you fight within your emotions. My desire for you today is that you could see the hope that can be present even in the midst of the heaviest and darkest season you might be facing emotionally. Now, this is a topic that we often shy away from in the church because Honestly, it can be messy, but but also because I think we often have this assumption that if I'm following Jesus, then I should be happy, cheerful, and have a smile on my face all the time. But that's not what we see in the life of Martin Luther, and it's actually not what we see in the case of the life of Jesus either. You see, following Jesus doesn't mean we are guaranteed a problem-free or pain-free life. After all, this wasn't the case for Jesus himself. In fact, this is what the prophet Isaiah would write about him in Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. He wrote, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. What this means is that same prison that so many of us find ourselves in today or have found ourselves in at different points in our lives once housed another resident and his name was Jesus. Jesus has been in those dark valleys. He's lived with the heavy burden, his emotions placed upon his shoulders. He has experienced the loneliness that seems to smother a person during those seasons. In fact, We see recorded later in Matthew's gospel, one of those incredibly difficult moments that Jesus experienced just before his death on the cross. In Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31, here's what it says. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again after they had mocked him. They took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Think of how lonely and discouraging this must have been. The men that Jesus had called to be his disciples, had poured his life into, were now gone. The very people he had come to give his life for were now mocking him and treating him as if he were nothing more than a joke. 
the soldiers would take advantage of the claim that he was the king of the Jews and would pay quote-unquote homage to his supposed king. It was an incredibly cruel way to treat an innocent prisoner who had already been beaten. Now, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in that emotional prison only to be further mocked, ridiculed, or shamed. This is where the loneliness can become overwhelming. Jesus was not only in that difficult emotional place, but God had predicted he would experience this depth of emotional pain hundreds of years earlier. And and when the weight of your own emotions overtakes you, the thing that becomes paralyzing and debilitating is there doesn't seem to be a way out. We walk through life, sometimes maybe even avoid crowds of people because the prison we find ourselves trapped in is locked and we don't seem to have the key. Jesus was there. He found himself in that very lonely, isolated place as these soldiers mocked him, shamed him, and treated him as nothing more than an object of humiliation. But Jesus didn't walk into this deep, dark prison just to emphasize empathize with its residents. He didn't experience this deep emotional sorrow just so he could say, I know how you feel. Later in Isaiah 53, we read that God's ultimate purpose was for Jesus to walk into such a difficult experience. He had a reason. Here's what it says in verse 10 of Isaiah 53. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. See, Jesus didn't experience the emotional pain so many of us live with on a daily basis to simply stay there. God had to place Jesus in that prison for a reason. See, Jesus walked into that prison to become the key that throws open the prison doors for us. He went to this dark place emotionally that we could provide, he could provide the one thing that every resident of this prison would need in the years to come. It is one thing that is often longed for but rarely seen in the depths of depression, discouragement, or guilt. It's a simple word that has the power to change a person's entire world. Jesus went to this difficult place to bring hope to you and me. And the hope Jesus brings into our lives is more than just some theoretical idea. It is truth. It is a truth that there is a way out, that there is an escape hatch. You don't have to live in this prison forever. Jesus came that the truth could set you free. Now, I don't say that in any way to minimize the struggle of depression or emotional turmoil or to hint at the idea that you could just get Jesus and all the stuff you and your therapist or counselor discuss will just disappear. What I'm saying is that Jesus experienced the full weight of human emotion to blaze a trail out of that hell on earth. You don't have to stay in that prison forever. There is hope. I loved how the author of Hebrews writes it in Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, that at our darkest moment, Jesus went before us not just to experience what we have, but ultimately to conquer it. Does that mean that our depression, discouragement, or pain disappear? Not necessarily. What it means is that in your prison, you can have the one thing that will help you break out, hope. And Paul tells us in Romans 5.5, that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who who has been given to us. If you find yourself walking through a difficult emotional season, you find yourself battling depression, anxiety, or fear, My desire today is not to tell you just to get over it, act like those emotions don't exist, or in any way to minimize the impact a professional counselor can have in your life. My desire is twofold. First, to let you know that you don't have to be in this struggle alone. We are here to fight for you, cry with you, and walk that dark valley alongside you. This is what being part of the family of God is all about. Secondly, that difficult prison you find yourself in is not meant to be your final resting place. Jesus came to be the key that throws open the doors of your own emotional jail cell. How does that, how does that happen? It happens by embracing the hope that only Jesus can provide. That's not simply by making one decision in a church, but by making one decision after another, believing the truth of what Jesus says about you. 
not what your emotions or circumstances are telling you. That hope will become an anchor to your soul. It will become a fixed point in the chaos of your inner world that will allow you to find your bearings again. Practically speaking, that means putting yourself in places that bring freedom, not isolation. Find yourself in a safe, healthy community that encourages you to be who God says you are, a small group, a life group at your church, uh, uh, whatever it might look like, that's, those are great places to be at. Allow the words you dwell on to be God's words about you, not what others say about you or the lies that you have rolling around in your head. That means open up your Bible on a regular basis, highlight God's promises, even commit them to memory. And every time you are tempted to believe the lies, recall those promises you've memorized and pull out that note card maybe you wrote those promises upon. Come back to what God is saying about you because God loves you. Jesus came to be the key to throw open the prison doors. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I thank you that you don't leave us or abandon us to our own devices, to our own circumstances, to our own struggles. But Lord, I pray today, Lord, whatever people might be walking through or experiencing, God, that you would blaze a trail, Lord, shine a beacon of hope through their darkness. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Jesus, thank you for dying and rising again three days later, Lord, to bring hope. Lord, I pray that you would bring hope into our lives and our experiences, our struggles that even depression, even in discouragement, that we would know there's a way out. Thank you, God, for caring about us and loving us so much as you do. Lord, I pray for those that might not know you, Lord, that today they could say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Transform me from the inside out. I commit my life to your purposes. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special day online. It's amazing how God can use technology to still minister to you and where you're at. Have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless.